There we go. Good evening and praise the Lord, everyone. It took us a couple of minutes to get a couple of mics taken care of, but uh, if you're out there, we're glad that you're with us tonight. Amen. And uh, we got a lot of good feedback from uh, uh, the weekend. We're going to try to work on trying to improve certain things and and uh, and do whatever. But uh, I'm sure everybody is uh, uh, about to lose their mind in some cases, being locked up, cooped up for a long time. Amen. But, uh, you know, God's still good. Amen. And everybody is... To give you a full out, all out report, we uh, no one is sick. No one, brother Justin was uh, quarantined, uh, but on the test, uh, they're still waiting on it, his test. But I don't, I think it's negative. Uh, he just showed a few symptoms of uh, the flu. Amen. I'm thankful today that God has protected us, protected my family and your family from this uh, pandemic that's going on in this world. I, I, uh, it, uh, it kind of took us all by surprise, but you know, we can't, uh, we can't make the mistake to believe that since everything in the world is out of control, that God has lost control. Because the first thing we need to remember about Jesus Christ, Almighty God, He spoke the worlds into existence with just words. And I believe that he, before it's over with, He's going to speak into this situation and then to this crisis. Uh, there's a lot of good reports that are coming. Amen. And it uh, looks like they're going to try to uh, get our nation up and running again, hopefully by Easter. Just pray with us and pray with them that God allows that. What a beautiful time to come back together for after a while than Easter Sunday on Resurrection Sunday. We could all come in and celebrate not only the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but the resurrection and the deliverance of getting out of our homes and being able to walk among uh, the living. Amen. But, uh, Tonight, I want to talk on a certain thought because of the chaos and the uh, panic that has been uh, created with this new virus that is uh, attacking not only our community or our nation, we are under a global attack. And the worst part about this enemy is it's invisible. You never know. And just like today, I'm, I was watching news bites and, and media. Everybody's watching the media and televisions and reading the papers and listening to the radio. And this is no respecter of persons. Uh, they said the Prince of uh, the Prince of England, Prince Charles or whatever, has been tested positive. There's movie stars that are testing positive. And then there's just common people that are testing positive on the uh, uh, virus. So it's not just for one or two, and, uh, but it's, it's, it's touching everyone, and everyone is feeling the effects of this. But I believe that uh, if we will hold on, that uh, God will help us through this situation. He has, if he's able to save us and bring us out of sin, he's able to do anything. Uh, if he brought you out of a, a bad situation in your life, if he, if he puts your family back together, if he's done all those sorts of things, God can do anything that needs to be done. That's why we cannot interpret the presence of problems as the absence of God. God has always done his greatest work in times of difficulty and struggle. Just look at your testimony today. Just look at your witness today how you were lost, how you were destitute, how you were broken, how you had lost your way. You could not, you couldn't get out of your own way, much less find a way to help yourself. But Jesus Christ, one visit to that altar, one step towards him, 
and everything began to change, not dras- casually, but it spontaneously. God took away desires that you struggled with your whole life. He took away uh, addictions that have plagued you and controlled you for, for, for decades. Uh, but that's the power of Almighty God. That's why we cannot misinterpret what's really happening in this world. If he was able to speak a world into existence and light into darkness and breathe the breath of life into mankind, then I want you to know he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ever ask or think, but it's according to what is inside of us. So as a church, I know you're not in the building with me here right now, but let's unite together right now in our prayer, in our voices, in our efforts right now, and let's ask God to be with us here tonight. Amen. And that that he would break the word and break the bread right before us. And God will strengthen someone, give someone an answer, help one someone with something that's going on in their life. Let's pray right now. Lord, we love you and thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your promises, oh God. We thank you for everything that you have done. Hallelujah. And we thank you, God, for what you're going to still do. Lord God, we know this is not the end. It's just a delay. Hallelujah. It's just temporary. But we know that we can put our trust and confidence in you today because you have never failed us nor forsaken us. You've never abandoned us or forgot us, but you have gone with us all the way through. God, help us to walk through this situation and come forth. Hallelujah. With more power and strength than we've ever had in Jesus' name. Anoint your word. Anoint the the voice. Anoint the scriptures tonight, oh God, speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. In fact, God has laid a thought on my heart tonight. How do we find peace in the face of uncertainty? Solomon wrote in Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, he said, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And this is a very important part of the scripture. And lean not unto thine own understanding or reasoning. He said in verse 6, in fact, he said, In all thy ways acknowledge him. Keep him in the forefront. Keep him out where he needs to be in your life and in the right place, hallelujah, on the list of your life. And he shall direct thy paths. In other words, Solomon is reminding us in almost every case, every situation, every challenge that we may face, that if we will allow God to help uh, regulate that situation and help reach into that situation, God is a better judge of things than we've ever been. If you don't believe me, Look at your life now. When you had control of your life, you was a mess. You couldn't get anything right. You couldn't hit both ears at the same time, looking in a mirror. But I'm telling you, God knows what's best for us here today. And this is nothing more than a situation that this world needs to go through. In fact, I'm going to show you tonight that I believe that this is an awakening for the church. We are in an hour and a time when the God, the trumpet of God could sound at any time and we could all be caught away and not have to worry about anything, much less a virus. We are at the threshold, the door of the coming of the Lord, and it could happen in any moment according to the Bible that I read. And tonight you're going to see this. I believe God has done nothing more than warn his church that it's time to prepare yourself and prepare your way and position yourself so that you will be ready and you will secure and ensure that you are ready when Jesus Christ comes for his church. I want to be ready, don't you? Because if you look at this, He's a better judge of things than we are. Like, like now, we we got we are so some are so distracted and confused because of everything around us and before us that we have completely forgot about what's in us today. 
That's why I'm telling you, just because it looks like the whole world has lost control, God has never lost one step in the face of this virus. He's going to prove to many that, that are believers and followers of his, that he's going to prove to you that he is a faithful and a just God, and he will be there in the time of trouble. That's what the Solomon, that's what many writers wrote throughout the world. He is that very present help in the time of trouble. If you've ever been sick and God showed up and healed somebody in your body, that's because he's a faithful God. And this situation is not any bigger than a cancer that we've heard about being healed uh, or, or, or a situation, a job situation opening up uh, or whatever. I want to preach today to tell you, uh, you can find peace uh, even in the most unsecure and insecure places in life, in the most darkest places of life, I have found God to be more faithful and more powerful than I ever dreamed he, he was able. I've said it over and over again. David didn't find the tables on the mountain. And that's why we need to study the Word of God. That's why Bible studies are very important. Because it teaches us, see, I don't need you to tell me how to shout when I'm on a mountain. But pastor, I need you to teach me how to survive when I'm in the darkest days of my life and I'm being challenged on every side. Whenever, when everything that seemed to be all together, now all of a sudden it's falling apart. We've got different ones in our church. As soon as the news come down about this virus, they couldn't keep up with their work. Now they can't find work. But that doesn't mean that God has forgotten you. That does not mean God has abandoned you. Uh, that does not mean that God has left you. Uh, but he's going to tell you, you stay with me and you trust me in all thy ways. Uh, Hallelujah. And with all thine heart, lean not on under your, thine own understanding. In all thy ways, trust him. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. And I'm talking to somebody. He shall direct your pathway. He will answer your prayers. He knows exactly what he's doing here today. Hallelujah. And, and, and that's why Solomon is telling us that our greatest weapon is to continue to trust in the Lord and nothing else. That's where Isaiah found the words to write in Isaiah 26 and 3, where he said he will keep us in perfect peace if we continue to trust in him. What did he say? Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. And I know it's harder to believe when the landscape of our nation, in fact, the entire landscape of our world is changing daily, almost by the hour. Today, there was another 200 more cases in Illinois and then over 100 more positive tests come in in, in the state of Missouri. T today, Missouri was, was considered to be uh, a state of emergency, and they're going to be sending supplies and different things from the government. In fact, President Trump today, in a speech out on the uh, on the lawn today, said that out of 180 countries, continents, and nations in this world, this virus has affected and touched 150 of them already. So we're not alone. OK, we're not alone. That's why how many times have you sh stood up in a church service or been in a church service and you, you knew somebody in that service that day? They were troubled in their spirit and they 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 were they had lost their focus because of something in their life and they didn't even have to say anything. But 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 then all of a sudden God laid it upon your heart. Hallelujah, to, to go and speak to them and tell them here, he'll give you a peace beyond all understanding if you will just stay and on your mind will stay on him and you will trust in him today. And all of a sudden you begin to speak into those people's lives and they come back to you later and they said, thank you for that day. Thank you for your voice. Thank you for speaking into my spirit. 
Thank you for doing what you have done. See, God uses his church to encourage his church to lift his church. He uses his church to bring good things to the, to the world and to our community. That's why he sent salvation to the church so you could find salvation through the church. The same concept is in everything else in life. I know God is faithful. He's been faithful to me. He's going to be faithful to you. Hallelujah. How do I know? Because he's never left me or forsaken me. He has gone with me. And today you may need to just pray, God, if you're not going to take me out, give me the courage to face it head on. Let me walk through there. Because see, when David looked at God that day and he said, I know I'm facing and I'm standing under the shadow of death. I'm, it's overshadowing me. I feel it all around me. And then when he began to walk through that corridor that day, he found a rod and a staff. He found God's presence and power and his spirit and truth was present in that corridor corridor that day. as he walked through that valley that day, he found something in that valley uh, that he does, will never fear ever having to go back to that valley because he found a strength and a power that only you can find in some of your adversities and trials in life. It's the adversity that's going to make you stronger. If you study weightlifting like me, I'm a, I'm a weightlifter. I lift 20 ounce steaks and two pound Lobster tails, I'm pretty good. 18-ounce glass of tea, I can curl them all night, you know. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. It's, it's not the weight that's the most important. It's that restriction that the tendons and the muscles feel that build the strength in them. You know, they, they did a survey one time, and they brought all the plants in the entire world and put it in a big aquarium. And they put they watered them and they gave them fake sun and, and real sun. And they did about all the ultraviolet. They just wanted to see how these plants would, would handle various situations and circumstances. And then one day after about two months, they walked in. And the beautiful palm trees that had been standing in the aquarium was now laying flat on the ground. And they said, as they began to study, they were puzzled for a long time. Until one day, they just opened the sides up and let the wind blow through. And after two days of wind, the palm trees began to rise back up. It wasn't the sun that they missed. It wasn't the water that they missed. It was the wind. The wind is what made them strong. The wind is what made them stand stronger. And sometimes that adversity in your life, that's why Solomon was telling, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. It gets hard sometimes. And that's what's been happening around here because of the landscaping of our nation, of our community. I mean, one day we get to go everywhere. Today we got to stay at home. I don't understand. I love going to restaurants. And Sunday, we were here, our little crew was here, and we didn't get to go to a restaurant, so we brought the restaurant to us. That's what you got to do. You got to learn to emphasize, okay? Em yeah, you know the word I'm trying to say. Emphasize. <laughs> Improvise. You got it? See, I was checking you. <laughs> but what happens is, if you, can't, if you can't go to it, bring it to you, you know? That's kind of like in my, I'm glad that somebody didn't wait for me to come to them to tell me about Jesus. I'm glad somebody come and told me about Jesus. That's why I thank God every day for a lady named Shirley Bidinger and a lady named Sister Francois back in 1966 that knocked on our door at 22, 1222 Omar Street. And they introduced us to a person named Jesus Christ. And when we came that day, our lives have never been the same because we found out we can live in the worst of storms and in the toughest of times because we put our trust in God and we acknowledge God in all our ways. And he directed us to where we are here today. And I know everything is changing or canceling all the sports events. All our communities are canceling everything. 
Thank God that Datha and Steve got married the week they did because they wouldn't have been able to get married today. They would have had to do it by themselves, but they got to enjoy a large crowd, and we got to enjoy the great food. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Amen. Steve's still paying for it. <laughs> Ain't that right, Steve? Right. But I know everything is changing in counseling, the sports event, everything. But we can rest assured that regardless of what happens elsewhere, God's faithfulness and promises will never counsel, cancel or stop from reaching us. God is able to go beyond even the tough places. And I know some of us have been affected by this situation, this virus. Some are laid off. Everyone's under a stay in, stay in order. But I'm glad we are able to live stream here today. And hopefully you are enjoying it and we are tweaking everything to make it clearer and sound better. We're going to increase our, 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 our uh, internet. That'll give us more clarity and uh, it'll, it'll make it look better on the screen. So hang in there with us. Amen. But we got a lot of good feedback. Thank you for all that. But see, as I look at this situation, that's why I can't read Colossians 1, 16 and 17 enough because it gives me that assurance that if God be for me, who can be against me? Like Paul had. Because in Colossians, Paul was telling the church, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible. We got first Colossians 16 and 17. Give me that real fast. He said, for by him were all things created. I read this a few weeks ago. That are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things are created by him and for him. But he goes on to say in 17, and he is before all things and by him all things consist. That's why Paul was telling them we must remain faithful and trust in God regardless what we may face or experience. Our life will become meaningless and empty. That's why whenever you were on your own, you could not fix yourself. It took the hand and the act of Almighty God. It took the power and the spirit of Almighty God. It took the Holy Ghost. That's why still to this day, if you will repent of your sins, be baptized in Jesus' name, he'll give you a gift called the Holy Ghost that'll keep you every day for the rest of your life. And it will heal you. It will deliver you. It will free you. It will sustain you, strengthen you, lift you, whatever you need today. That's what God wants to do. That's why all these writers are telling us that regardless what we may face or experience, if we will remain faithful and we will continue to trust in God, that life will have meaning and life will always have purpose. That's why he told Timothy that God did not give you the spirit of fear, Timothy. He didn't give you the, the fear that you are experiencing in your life right now. And the reason Paul told him that is, and the reason I want to tell you, the fear that's in your life right now, the questions that are in your mind right now, God didn't give you those questions. Your God is greater than that. Your God is more powerful than that. Your God can raise, rise up, lift up, encourage whatever you need today. He's able to do that. And the reason Paul told Timothy that, he wanted him to know that when we allow fear to dominate and control us, it actually neutralizes our faith and our effectiveness in everything we do. There's, when, you're, when you're troubled about something, does it not affect everything that you do? It affects your job. It affects your home. It, it, it begins to step in the way of the relation between you and your spouse. And there's things that have bothered me before that I, I, I would, gave a snappy answer to my wife. I hope she's not listening because I just admitted that I was, I was wrong. And uh, I'm sure if Michelle's watching or 
Sister Richards, they wrote it down. They're going to call her or text her right away. But, uh, but there's certain things in our life, they affect us. And they will affect us in the natural and in the spiritual. And they neutralize things in our life. And we can't be who we need to be. We can't do the things we need to do. We're, we, we're not the same person when we allow fear to grip our hearts. And that's why Paul told Timothy, I don't care what everybody around you. See, he had people in the church that were telling him he was too young to be the pastor. Well, that's not the case here. I'm as old as dirt, you know. But it happens. There's some that don't think that you could be in the ministry you're in or do the things that you do because you're who you are or you're the age that you are. But I speak against that today. That's not what God says. When he calls you, he has purpose for all of us. When he saved you, he did it for a reason. He didn't do it for you just to show up to church twice a week and clap your hands and rejoice and be happy and go fellowship with the people of God every once in a while. No, he had a purpose and he had a plan for you. That's why he was doing and did everything he could do to reach you. And if he's seeking and he's reaching for you right now, like there's ones in our church right now, they have all kinds of questions, and I love questions. You can never ask enough questions. God has every answer that you're looking for right here within the pages of his word, and he's going to lead and guide you into all truth. He's going to show you the way to the promise. He's going to give you the answers you search for, and he's going to fill you with his spirit if you obey the steps and the plan of salvation. That's all you got to do. It's not hard. The Bible says if a man will repent, what is repentance? That's asking God to forgive you of all your wrongdoings. You don't have to list them. Nobody in this church wrote down everything they did wrong. All they did, they, they, they won all the battles with one, one sentence, and that is, God, please forgive me. That's all you have to do. Because when you ask God to forgive you, you're going to find peace in the, any area of your life. And God is going to be just and faithful to forgive you. And then if you're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, he said, ye shall receive the gift. In other words, it's a gift. You don't even have to ask for it. It's going to come. And we got, just so everybody knows, we got our baptistry and it is up and half full of water. So if you want to be baptized, you need to get with me or Brother Caleb or Brother Bender, and we'll get you baptized because God is going to do the work in you that he has started. He don't start something and not finish it. He starts it, finishes it, and complete it. In fact, that's what Paul said. What I love about the scripture where Paul said, you can be confident in this very thing. If you can find that, Brother Bender, it says you can be confident of this, confident of this very thing, that he that be, has begun a good work in you, he will complete that work. He will finish what he starts in all of us. There it is, Philippians 1 and 6. Look it up for yourself. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That word perform means complete, finish. How many knows him today to be a finisher? He completes what he starts in your life. Hallelujah. That's why we can't allow these spirits that are all around us today to begin to dominate and control us. But we need to trust God today because it will neutralize your faith and effectiveness. And we don't want that today. We want you to be able to believe God and see that he is. That's all the Bible says we have to do. Believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that what? Diligently seek him. That's why uncertainty will always be one of the toughest spirits to fight in this world. In fact, this, the spirit of this virus is a different kind of spirit. Today, we are fighting with the unknown, and nobody likes the unknown because this enemy is invisible we don't know where it is, and it isn't just affecting one race or one certain level of people. It's affecting and happening to everyone. And now they said that it has touched and affect every country and continent. I wrote that down in the world now. 
That's why we as believers, we don't need to look around and allow our surroundings and our fears to control us or to stop us. In fact, instead of looking around, Luke twenty two fifty six says to look up because when these things, Jesus told him, when these things begin to all the uncertainty, all the unknown, all the craziness and the chaos and, and, and the, the panic, when all these things begin to happen, he told him the church is about to experience the greatest moment ever in history. What did he say? There shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and upon the earth the stress of nations with perplexities. I think I got a little ahead of myself there, Brother Bender. I don't want Luke. This is in uh, right, right. But uh, in 21, 25, and 26, he talked about it. In fact, if you go back here, he's telling us that whenever these things begin to come to pass, he says, look up for your redemption. That's in 2256. Your redemption is just about ready to draw nigh. In other words, when these things begin to happen, the church needs to get excited because we're about to experience the greatest thing and what we've been waiting for our whole life, what we've been serving God our whole life, what we've been struggling and fighting for our whole life is we're going to be able to be caught away and be with him forever and ever and ever because our redemption is just about ready to draw nigh. But it's the unknown that we fear the most not knowing what to do or where to go. That's where some of us are. Who would have thought the day would come when we would see people fighting over toilet paper? Really? <laughs> I mean, I was scared to go to the store. I remember one time whenever I went and bought my little girls, it was they were young, you know, and, and the famous thing was cabbage patch dolls, you know. So my wife must have knew what was going to happen because she sent me to go get the cabbage patch dolls that day. And uh, I was wondering why that happened, because, you know, I was afraid I was going to see some of my, my friends, well, my people, my boys, you know. Guys don't go shopping for baby dolls, okay? Sorry. I didn't want to lose my man card, you know. Right, Jason? No. <laughs> Right. Okay. There you go. Well, there's a couple other guys in here. They, we've all been down. So we're all good, but, but I'll never forget. She told me to go get these cabbage patch dolls. And when I went in, I, I was first one in line. I got there early before they opened and I'm looking and I mean, there's a whole pallet wrapped real pretty of just every doll, every kind, everything every color of hair, every color of dress, all of it. And the girls were telling me, I want this one. I want this one. And I want that one. But the longer I stood there, see, they opened at nine. Every minute I stood there, I think another 50 women walked in behind me. There was no more men in that line. <laughs> it was the wildest thing you ever saw. And when they opened that door, those women ran over me getting to those cabbage patch aisles. And I got there, and they cut them open, and I just grabbed three of them, okay, and got out of there. I got hit with purses, kicked, cursed, everything. And that's what they said that people were doing with toilet paper the other day. They, I, I worked by Dollar General. They were taking people out of there in police cars. It looked like live PD on Wednesday. Every time a truck would come in, everybody's getting hauled off because they were fighting over toilet paper and water. But see, that's what is it? It's the unknown. And come to find out, I told my wife, in fact, I kind of fell for it and she wasn't going to do it. So, honey, it's my fault. But after a couple of days of seeing all this chaos, I said, well, you know, we may want to go get some food if we get locked in the house. But now every time you go to the store, they got everything. But just a couple of packs of toilet paper. But they they it was the wildest thing that I ever seen. But what was that that drove that? It was the fear of the unknown. They were unsure. 
some of the food some of these people bought will spoil before they even eat it. But they felt they had to have it. Why? Because they didn't know. That spirit of the unknown is what drives us sometimes. It's how the enemy gets victory over us a lot of times in our life and defeats our spiritual man. Because, you know, there's a time in our life we think we know everything. But we find out we don't know a whole lot at all. Because why? Because when we get to the place that we think that it's us and we know everything, we're not doing what, what he told us in all thy ways acknowledge him. He's not going to direct your path whenever you're not in the right place with him. That's why Jesus told us in 633 of Matthew, he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. You got to get God in his rightful place or you'll never experience the great and precious promises that Peter and different ones wrote about and the promises and the, and the blessings of God. One writer said are yea and amen. They are everything, in other words. See, that's why in Luke 21, and I'll read it here in a minute, Jesus is explaining all the things that will come and will happen the closer we get to the end of this earth. And after he talked about the wars and the rumors of wars and about how families and friends and people will turn against each other, and a chaotic spirit will run rampant, in our streets and in our communities and how we would see it everywhere that we go. That's when he ended everything with these words found in verse 25 and 26, where he said, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexities, distress, meaning great pain and anxiety. Sorrow everywhere, physical and mental sufferings everywhere, like we're seeing here today across our nation. Perplexities, he's saying, meaning a state of being confused and feeling the spirit of uncertainty. In fact, Jesus, after he talked about all the rumors of the wars, and all the things that were coming up on the earth and, and the earthquakes and the pestilence and all the things. He ended with this. He says in verse 26, how that men's hearts will fail them for the fear for and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the power of heaven will be shaken in those times. And that's, that's what's so powerful about what's happening right now. We are seeing fear at a level we've never seen it before. And this is what's controlling our world today. It's not all about the virus, but we are being controlled by the spirit of the unknown and the uncertainty and fear today. That's why Solomon said long before this day came, he wrote this text that I read to you today to put our trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to your own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct. How many knows God's able to direct your path? How many knows God's able to help you in the time of trouble? How many God has ever come and healed you when you had no one else there to help? How many has been in the car no one else around. You didn't even have time to call on his name. And you were facing a, a, a serious head-on collision or about to go into a tragedy that could have ended your life. And you didn't even have time to mention his name. But when you opened your eyes after you tried your best to call on his name and you were on the other side of that situation and don't know how in the world you got there, that's the kind of faithfulness I'm talking about there today. That's why Paul or Solomon said, you have to learn to let God do it his ways and in his timing, because if you will do that, you will find that he will be that help and he will do it. That's why we can't be troubled or affected by the issues or about our surroundings at any time, because it will cause us 
to lose our way and our purpose. In fact, over time, I've found and discovered a great value by trusting God and by believing in Him. And I wrote it down and I wrote it on here today. And that is, it actually works as a resolution, meaning it has taught me. Now listen, taught me to never let or allow difficulties or any opposition to affect or change my ways or my purposes. Because whenever he begins to be able to affect you and alter your pathway, you are heading in the wrong direction. Hallelujah. That's why when Paul was addressing the Thel- the Thessalonian church that day, he told them in 2 Thessalonians 2, and if you have your Bibles, you need to get and mark this. It's a lengthy reading at 1 through 12. He says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now listen in verse 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by leather, letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Then he went on to say in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. What day? The coming of the Lord. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all, now look at this, above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he, he as God setteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And that's what's going to happen in this world today. There's a day coming that this virus will pale in comparison of what's about to be unleashed upon this earth. That's why I believe this right here is nothing more than a warning to the church, a warning to the faithful, a warning to every believer that ever believed in their heart that it is time to make your calling and election sure. It's time to get faithful with God in everything you do. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and let Him direct your path uh, and keep you on that place and in that place that only He can keep you. And if you'll do that, you can secure and ensure that you will reach the end and you will finish the race that Paul talked about was hard to finish. Because there's going to be that one that exalts himself above all, now look at this, that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Then in verse 5, he said, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. That's what he was trying to tell them. He told them, and they asked him that day, and you've read this, you've read it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What shall be the signs of your coming? When do we know you're going to be coming? You know, whenever the church is going to know that he's going to be coming is when these things begin to come to pass. That's why I'm trying to tell you today, this is nothing. This pales in comparison to about what is going to be unleashed upon this earth before the coming of the Lord. And that's why the Bible says the things that it says, that you need to be ready because if you are not ready, you will fall in the snares and you will follow the voices instead of the ways of God. You're going to follow the voice of men, and you're going to follow the voice of answers. You know what's going to make it easy for the Antichrist to stand up and do what he's doing? Because there's going to be a crisis that's going to be unlike any other crisis we've ever faced. Any other thing we've ever faced, he's going to stand up and be able to call power from heaven. He's going to have that power to do that, and he will deceive many, the Bible says. But he said you got to remember that I told you this, and I told you in verse 6, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. 
Verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, the Bible says. Only he who now letteth, letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders. The, the world's trying to lie to us. The enemy's trying to lie to somebody today and tell you you're not going to get past this. But I speak into that situation just as he spoke light into darkness. I speak into it as your pastor and leader. We're going to win this battle. I read the back of the book. It gets tough. It gets hard. It gets dark. It gets difficult. But don't forget what the book says. We win. And we are going to win this battle. And we're going to come through victorious. Whether we get a stimulus package or not, whether they send us money or not, God takes care of the faithful. That's why you need to be faithful. That's why you need to be faithful to church. That's why you need to be faithful to praying and, ded and devotion to God. You've got to dedicate your life daily to God. You know what? If every one of us in this church would be as dedicated uh, to God as we are our own lives, we would be an incredible church. Because nothing's ever going to stand in front of us. We're going to go to work whether we're sick or half dead. And if we learn to do that for Jesus Christ, when God called me to start this church three and a half years ago in O'Fallon, it was a sad, it was a cold breeze in the air when I walked in that building. There was 80 chairs and there was only two people, which happened to be me and my wife the day we started this church. But how many has been coming to church in the last six months or a year and seen how the glory of God has come and it fills this place? It was in here, it's in here right now, and you guys ain't here. You're out there in TV land somewhere, out in movie land, where, out, out in cyberspace. You're seeing me, but I love this. This is awesome. We're going to keep doing this forever. But the point of it is. The Bible says where two or three are gathered together in my name. In your living room right now, if there's two or three of you sitting there, he likes three, but he'll take two. And if you'll start believing God right now for whatever you need in your life, God will fulfill every promise, every dream, and every blessing that you ever needed. He'll do for you what no other power can do. And that's what, that's what Paul was trying to tell them. Verse 10, and without, with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perishes because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Why do you need to trust God? If you want to be saved, you're going to have to learn to trust him. If you're going to want to be saved, you're going to need to know this. I didn't write that verse 10. That they, because the reason that they were deceived and the reason they were turned away because they received not the love of the truth. I didn't write it. It's right there. That they might be saved. Now watch this. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusions. Now watch this. Even worse than that, he's going to let you believe the lie you're living this very moment. And if you go down, that they all might be damned in verse 12, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's why I believe this is nothing more than a warning, alarm and an awakening for the church to become more alert and be more attentive and begin to prepare your way and position yourself because I believe that the master of the house is about ready to rise up. And when he shuts to the door, no man is going to enter. And I don't say that to call, bring fear in your heart or to confuse you today, but there is a time. Remember this. The day... That Noah went in the ark, 
everybody on the outside drowned. No one was saved. Same thing's going to happen. That's why the one writer said, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, but narrow is the way that leadeth to life everlasting, and few be there that find it because of the things that are about to come upon this earth. This virus has nothing compared to what will come upon this earth. I don't know what it is, but I believe God is able to take care of me now, and he will take care of me then because my trust is in him and nothing else. But that's why I believe this is nothing more than a warning to every one of us as believers that you need to make your calling and election sure. You need to quit questioning everything, and you need to start obeying the Word of God. I didn't write this book, but I found out it is a book of truth. It's a book that gives me power. It's a book that gives me strength. It's a book. I've seen many of you come in here. As I'm sitting here, I got a picture last Sunday while service was going on, and I could see Steve. I knew he was crying because he looked like he was snowing around him. He had so many napkins and hankies and and Becky when there was there was Jackie's all up. I mean, he, he looked like he was watching his favorite movie and he's leaning up there looking right at the service. Don't ever stop doing that, Jack. God's got a lot for you, son, and he's going to do greater things in your life. You tell him if he ain't there, Becky, God's got so much more for every one of us. But we have got to receive a love. We've got to create and develop a love for God's truth or we will both be lost. Because all of us saw how quick and swift our world can be changed and guided where they wanted to take us. If they were able to do it with a virus, they're going to be able to do it with anything. Whenever I looked at that, I only saw one thing. One day there's going to be a one world government. It's in the Bible. I don't have time to cover it tonight. There's going to be one world money. There's going to be one world. And you know what? It's like a young man walked in my office the other day that has never been in this church, has never received the Holy Ghost. But he knew something was going on. Dave Preston was with me there that day. If you're there, Dave, you'll agree. He walked in, and without hesitation, he asked me this question. Do you think this virus is part of the end time? I said, all I want to tell you, young man, I don't know about no virus. I didn't read about it in the Bible. I know there's going to be a lot of people that are going to die before this day comes. It's going to die of something. But the point is, the earth is the last place any of us want to be on when Jesus comes. When the church is caught away, this is the last place that you want to be. That's why today you've got to know, you've got to develop, and you've got to receive a love for the truth. I don't understand certain things, Pastor. Ask me the questions. I told you I love questions. Because I believe if God has led you this far, he has so much for, for, more for you. He's going to let you touch truth. And then once truth has touched you, he will lead and guide you into all truth. I can't lead you there, but he will lead and guide you to that truth. And he will give you a blessed assurance. See, I don't fear the arrow that flies by day. I don't fear tomorrow. I don't fear today. My fear is I fear the Lord. I fear that I will fail him and that I will be lost. That is a good fear. That you get up every morning and you let him know, I am glad that I know you, God. And more than that, I'm glad that you know me. And when you have that blessed assurance, you have just secured your place in eternal life. But it goes on. It would have been easy for many of us to fall or to be led away from truth because of the fear we just experienced. Some of us, I mean, we got laid off and it looked like the, the end of the world. But he's just giving you a sample of how rough and tough it's going to be. You know, you know, I got people that actually believe that if they miss the rapture, 
Jesus, when the trumpet sounds, the church is called away. You know what it says. The dead in Christ will rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up. There's some that actually believe in their hearts. And that thought is going to deceive them because they feel if they don't go the first time, they'll just hold on and not take the mark and do all the other things. And they'll, they'll get there before. So let me tell you something. You don't make it the first time. You're not going to make it the second time. Because before the first time comes, there's going to be all kinds of stuff going on. And we haven't even tapped into what is going to be unleashed. I know I'm not a doom and gloom preacher. I don't believe in trying to bring fear in the heart of people, scare them into coming to serve God. But I earnestly and I plead with you today, obey the word. This word is going to deliver you like it delivered me and those that you know that got around you that have even invited you to this church. God can do a work if you'll let him. But see, some of us would have been easy for us to give up now because we just, all we did was lose the finances. You know, money. I mean, what about my car payments? And, you know, we before we sat back and sat down and began to think about it, well, every time I've ever been laid off, I could call my bank where I have payments and they would forgive me for the month or roll it back. Come to find out everybody in every bank and financial institution in the world is calling and telling everybody, we're going to roll you back 90, 60 days, 90 days, six months, whatever it is. That's how easy it would have been to be deceived and sit there and be troubled about nothing. And that's how clever this enemy is. That's why Jesus was teaching them from the beginning to now, to, to never ignore what's around you and start trusting what is in you and what the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of God tries to do through you. That's why Matthew in Matthew 24, 22 said, the day will come. We got that up there. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved. That's what Matthew's trying to say here, that the day will come that except those days be shortened, shortened, there will be none of us saved. Why? Because they will be fearing the things that are happening or about to come upon this earth. That's why we must not allow this situation or any situation to distract us or separate us from anything or in any way when it comes to our experience. That's why Paul said at the end of his first letter of Corinthians, he said, we must remain steadfast and unmovable. And we must all be always positioning ourselves and preparing ourselves for anything that God is about to send, if we hope to be saved. That's why I look at this as nothing more than a warning from God. See, he said, now listen to me. If you read that story where Jesus asked all the disciples, he asked them this question, whom do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? He wanted to hear what they had to say. Some of them didn't understand what he was asking them, just like some of you won't receive what I'm saying here because it's a little harsh. But the, remain still, the fact still remains. He was trying to teach them something there that day, just like I'm trying to teach you something here. Don't fear that arrow that's flying around us right now. Your fear needs to be in God. Your trust needs to be in God. Don't trust in chariots. Don't trust in the horses. Don't trust in men. Put your trust in God today. Because Jesus Christ made a promise one day. And he said these words. He kept asking them, who do you say? They said, well, maybe you're the prophet. Or maybe some say you're Elias. Or some say you're this. Or some say you're that. But he kept asking them. And he's asking you here today. Who do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who do you say? That's when Peter stood up and he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's when Jesus looked at him and said, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, 
but the word of God revealed it to Peter. And he said, because thou, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I shall build and I will build my church. And you know why I don't fear what's going on around here or anything that is to come? Because he made a promise that day, and it was a perpetual promise that still stands true today. He says, I will build my church upon a rock, and the gates of hell itself shall not ever be able to prevail against it. And then he went on to say, and because you do know who I am, I'm handing you some keys today. And he told him, whatever you bind on earth, you're going to bind in heaven. When this came at me, you know what I did? I started binding things and I started loosening things because I have that authority. I'm a child of the king. This church that I joined and the part that I have and the Holy Ghost that I have is the same spirit that gave them an authority that day. And I'm able to look at whatever I coming at me and I can control it with just the words of my voice and the spirit and will in my heart and mind. And I can look that. Why do you think he said, if you'll just have the grain of a mustard seed? No, you're not going to look at this little napkin and say, but you can look at a mountain. The writer said, and say, be thou removed. And the Bible says, it shall be removed. That's why today, that's why Paul was writing to us. And when Paul first wrote to Thessalonians, they were in during danger of losing their hope too. Because they too were fearing the things around them and happening to them instead of remembering what was in them. And Paul was trying to bring balance and stability back into the church and back into their experience and back into their life. And sometimes the pastor has to shake you with the words of God and with, with harsher words and tell you, don't you fear what's out there today, but you hold on to the word of God. You, that's the only sure thing that you have right now. You thought you had security in your job and your job may have just laid you off. So there is no security in that, but security is always in Jesus Christ and whatever you need, he will supply. How many out there today can raise your hand and say everything I ever needed and when I needed it, all I had to do was call on his name and he came to the rescue or he opened the door or he made a way out of no way or he did the impossible like the day I received the Holy Ghost. I didn't deserve the Holy Ghost, but I asked him and he loved me anyway and he cared for me anyway and he brought me out anyway and he delivered me anyway and he set me free and he made me who I am today. It wasn't because of what someone else did. It was what God did. Almighty God did for me. And that's why he was trying to tell the Thessalonian church that day what was in them. Don't allow that to happen to you today. Don't fear today or tomorrow. But trust in God today. And all thy ways acknowledge him. And you will never lose your way. You will never not have the answer that you need because he's faithful. See, that's why Paul was trying to bring balance and stability back into the church. And he was reminding them that certain things had to happen before Christ returns, but be confident when he comes, if you're ready and you'll remain true and faithful, you will be caught away with the Lord. And this is what I'm trying to do. Hallelujah. This is what I'm trying to do. This has caught all of us off guard. It has shaken every, every one of us everywhere in the world. But we need not fear what's happening. We must begin to make every adjustment we need to make to secure and ensure we are ready when the dues when the things come that are going to come and when God returns to take his church. So tonight, my prayer is God help us lead us in the ways of righteousness 
in the pathways of truth. Create in me, like the psalmist said, create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit. God, don't cast me away for my shortcomings, but teach me your ways. The disciples, they asked Jesus for everything. They even asked Jesus, teach us to pray. That's where the Lord's Prayer come from. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You don't know how to pray, I challenge you today. Pray the Lord's Prayer every morning. The Lord is, you know, my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me. And you go through these things. Find different prayers that you can pray. There's the tabernacle prayer. It teaches you how to do things correctly, that whenever you step into the holiest of holies, that your preparation will gain you access to, into his throne room every time you need to go. You can't forget what got you here. You can't forget it was the word of God. It was the hand of God. It was the truth of God. It was the spirit of God that delivered you and set you free. And it's going to take all of that stuff that got you here right now to get you where you're going. But if you'll hang on and you'll trust, you will find peace even in the face of the uncertainty and the unknown that is in our world today. Put your trust in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your promises. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for everything that you have done in our lives to this point. No, it's not always been bright and sunshiny. It's not always been happy, clappy. It's not always been exciting or the most pleasant. But it's been the most needful thing in our life. Teach us your ways. Show us the way to your promises. Lead us to that eternal life that the Word of God speaks about. Lead us to that heavenly place where we won't have to worry no more, where we won't have to fear no more, where there's no more death, no more pain, no more suffering, no more sickness. Prepare us for that place, God. God, we understand today that we are facing challenges. God, give us the courage to face them. Give us the courage to face tomorrow, if tomorrow is given. Give us the courage to face our next challenge. Give us the courage to believe that you were able to supply for us before you could supply for us again. These people that are one day they have abundance and they have plenty, and today all they have is cancellations and denials. And they stand and they look at their situation and their scenario. And they say, how can we come forth unscathed and unhurt? But God, I want you to show them today that you are a God that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, but it's according to the power that worketh in us. Let faith rise in us. Reach into these homes right now, wherever your people are watching this live stream. I pray God reach to them right now. and Whatever answers they need, whatever strength they need, whatever healing they need, whatever help they need, whatever guidance they need, whatever instruction they need, give that to them. Grant it to them today because it's not your will that any should perish, but that all should have eternal life. Go with us, but not from us. Bring us back Sunday on our next live feed. And we look forward to the day that we'll be able to gather again together in the house of God and celebrate our victory once again. Go with us, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have a couple of announcements. Young people wanted me to let you know that the cupcakes that they are selling, they are still selling them. Amen. So let's help them out. Amen. I think that one Sunday morning I bought like five dozen. So you got to buy some. Okay. I can't eat five dozen cupcakes, but I'll give them to somebody if they're here. But we're going to plan on Easter morning. It looks like we may be able to come back to church by Easter Sunday. Pray that God allows it. 
And if that happens, they will have the cupcakes here. If you can, call Swade or Taylor or notify me or my wife or Caleb and Stephanie or Brother Bender and Sister Bender. These people are always in contact with me. We can get your order to the young people. Let's help them out, you guys. $6 for a half a dozen, or what is it? $12 for a half a dozen, $20 for a dozen. But these are homemade cupcakes. Amen. And don't forget, continue to pray for the Sample family. There will be a memorial service in the St. Louis metro area after this season that we're going through passes, and we'll be able to all go pay our respects to the family and to the church family. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday morning. Thank you.